Welcome to our Ad Hoc Bed Biz podcast series. Today, I'm talking once more to Stephen Sidgin, who is a partner at the law firm Fox Williams. Many of you will already be familiar with both with Stephen and his firm, as they have been providing us with invaluable advice on agent and distributor contracts and other business contracts for many years. Today, we're focusing on terms and conditions of sale and purchase, and what can happen when these contracts go wrong. Welcome to our podcast series, Stephen. Thank you. So, why... Why are terms and conditions of sale and purchase important? What are they actually for? They provide a legal framework for a contract for the sale or purchase of goods, which is protective of the seller or the buyer, as the case may be. Sounds sensible. Um, So whose terms and conditions should take precedence, um, the sellers or the buyers? Because obviously both sides tend to have terms and conditions. Well, both sides should have terms and conditions. Um, That's not always the case. Uh, Sometimes uh, neither have. Sometimes one will have. But then their terms and conditions of sale or purchase, as the case may be, may not be properly incorporated into the contract which they make. But overall, the question of whose terms should apply, it follows very much uh, the issue of who is the more powerful commercially. That's quite a usual way of determining whose terms conditions apply. But the short point is, he who starts first will have the advantage It's the equivalent of playing chess and starting with the white pieces. It's the equivalent of playing tennis and having the first serve. He who starts first has the advantage. So I've heard of the term, the battle of the forms, which probably relates to this. What what exactly is that? Well, exactly. It does relate to this because given that the terms, conditions of sale, the terms, conditions of purchase, will or should certainly be protected of seller or buyer respectively, we often get to a situation where both seller and buyer want to have their terms conditions be the terms conditions so far as the contract is concerned. And so we have what is called the battle of the forms. Um, One party will write to the other saying, this is uh, my order. And I'd be very pleased if uh, you would accept it. And these are my terms, conditions of purchase. And the other side will write back saying, thank you very much. We are prepared to accept your order on the basis of our terms, conditions of sale. (laughs) At which point uh, there is a battle started between the two parties. The buyer in that situation, if it's got its wits about it, will respond and say, well, it's great that you're prepared to accept our order. However, all of our orders, as if some that has some significance, all of our orders are placed on the basis of our terms, conditions of purchase. Here they are again. And and the seller will say, and that's extremely kind of you to send those back to us. And we did see them the first time. However, we are prepared to supply you, but it's got to be on the basis of our terms, conditions of uh, sale. And we go forwards and backwards and backwards and forwards. And we can get to a situation which did actually involve one of our clients, which was a supplier uh, to a retail uh, company called Brantano. Different industry to the bed industry, fundamentally different, but it serves to illustrate the point. Um, We were brought in when Brantano went into administration. This would be around about 2016, 2017. And we advised our client on its position uh, so far as the administration was concerned. Our client had thought that it had incorporated properly into the contracts that it made with Brantano to supply Brantano with its goods. Uh, by reference to its terms, conditions of sale. However, Brantano, by K 
careful language, very careful language, and by making sure that it responded to each and every attempt by our client in order to um, incorporate our client's terms and conditions of sale, that Brantano, it responded uh, saying, no, 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 our, our terms and conditions of purchase apply, managed to get itself into a position that by the time the contract started to be performed, its terms and conditions of purchase applied. So we advised our client as to the position. It dealt with the administration as best it could. And um, we also advised our client subsequently on what it should be doing going forwards because it decided to trade with the new company which had emerged from the administration, which took the name Brantano. All goes well for about 12 months, and then Brantano number two goes into administration. One would have hoped that our client, having been told what to do, um, managed to avoid finding itself in the same or pretty similar position to the situation in which it had found itself on the first occasion when there was an administration. Uh, one would like to think that. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. It is very, very important if you're going to have your terms, conditions of sale or terms, conditions of purchase, and that you want them to form the basis of the contract, that they are properly incorporated into the contract, and that if there is a battle of the forms, that you're able to win that battle. Mm, it sounds um, a, a situation that, that isn't all that uncommon and an important point to make. Um, um, very important. So um, a lot of us just put some sort of standard terms and conditions on the back of an invoice or the front of an invoice. Is that actually sufficient? And, and if not, why not? <laughs> why not? Um, the short point is um, that... It rarely works if there is a problem. Rarely works because, yes, it is possible if there has been a long relationship, uh, a long course of dealing between the two parties, that putting the terms, conditions of sale on the back or the front of an invoice raised by the seller will work. But we're seeking to argue that there has been a course of conduct between the parties such that it has been established that it is a term of their trading relationship and therefore if you like an overall contract between an overriding contract between them that the terms conditions of sale uh, are part and parcel of that overriding contract uh, but as i say it's rare that that actually works uh, and if not, so if it doesn't work, what are the consequences? Well, for the seller, it may end up in a situation where the purchaser's terms, conditions of purchase apply, or both parties may end up in a situation where what is provided by statute, namely the Sale of Goods Act, applies. Is that so bad for the seller? Well, Usually, it is not so bad as would be the case if the buyer's terms and conditions of purchase applied, but it is usually not as good as if the seller was able to incorporate its terms and conditions of sale into the contract. And why does it really work? Well, the short answer is that the issuing of an invoice is usually one of the last, if not last, acts in the performance of a contract. In other words, the contract's already been made. It's already well done, well down the track of being performed. And then one party comes along and says, oh, here is our invoice. And by the way, um, these are our terms, conditions of sale, which we've mentioned on the front or the back of the invoice. And therefore, they apply to our contract. But then, in effect, what is happening is that the seller is wanting to unilaterally change, unilaterally vary that contract. And if it's on a unilateral basis, it's not going to work. So it's really a bit late in the process, isn't it? And and doesn't doesn't mean a lot if it's not been 
agreed on upon and signed by both parties, etc. That, that, that is correct. Mm, interesting. I should think quite a lot of people get caught out by that one. So, um, so moving on from that, obviously things can go wrong that are not necessarily in either the sellers or the purchases immediate and direct control. I, I believe the technical term for it is force majeure, and you often see that terminology in a contract. Um, um, and that can obviously cause things to be um, not go according to plan. So was, would Brexit be described as a, an event of force majeure? Uh, the courts here ruled that Brexit was not an event of force majeure. There was a case a couple of years ago. It involved the European Medicines Agency, which had some very nice offices in London Docklands area. And they sought to uh, get out of the lease of those premises by saying and the Brexit was an event of force majeure. That um, as a result of the occurrence of Brexit, uh, they could um, exit the, uh, the lease. And uh, the courts gave them short shrift. And the <laughs> courts were not interested. Okay. Essentially, it's important, though, to understand why. Mm. And I think the reason ultimately comes down to this. If there is to be reliance on an event of force majeure occurring, then there needs to be a statement in the contract as to what constitutes an event of force majeure. And Brexit was not referenced at all in the lease. And you may say, well, when the lease was entered into, it, it would have been surprising had it been mentioned because it was yeah. not contemplated. <laughs> However, the um, courts are not necessarily too interested in the fact that something is not mentioned. What they are interested in is what is mentioned. And it's therefore important that very, very clear words are used in uh, in the in the uh, drafting of a force majeure clause in the terms, conditions of sale, in the terms, conditions of purchase themselves. The courts look very closely at what is being said or not being said by way of comparison, um, and this caused me some amusement uh, some weeks ago um, there was a news clip i think it was on the bbc news and it was referencing the uh, poor service being delivered by trans pennine which is one of the rail operators and the bbc news had a trans pennine spokesperson saying that uh, trans pennine were pulling out all the stops in order to improve their service. To which uh, the um, cynic within me might say, well, of course, if a rail operator pulls out all the stops, the chances are it's likely to improve its service. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. I, it sounds quite challenging because you can't obviously, I'm intrigued as to how you could anticipate things that might be force majeure and actually specify what they might be before you know they've even happened. But uh, um, I suppose COVID pandemic was an, was another example. Is that Has that been classed as an event of force majeure? Uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, the courts have chosen to distinguish between a pandemic and an epidemic. Um, epidemic, yes, you do see that uh, from time to time in um, clauses in contracts dealing with uh, force majeure. Pandemic, certainly before COVID, no, you didn't see that. You saw epidemic. So in terms of how precise do I have to make my force majeure clause? The answer is the more precise, or if you prefer, the more comprehensive uh, it is drafted, the better it is likely to be. That sounds like uh, professional advice on that is definitely advisable. Um, 
Another legal term, I think, is um, um, is the concept of a frustration of a contact. I'm not sure it's terminology I would use, but what what does that mean? Are there any recent developments around that? Uh, well, there has been a recent development. Um, when a contract is frustrated, it is incapable of any performance. Um, the contract stops, and it stops as and when um, the contract is frustrated. The courts and the law generally do not like uh, contracts to be frustrated. Um, in, in a sense, it is, uh, it is against the interests of society that uh, a party could be able to argue and argue successfully that it was no longer required to perform a contract because the contract had been frustrated by something occurring. It's an adjunct of the concept of force majeure. Have there been any recent developments? Well, yes, there have. Um, although for decades um, there have been various attempts since um, legislation was introduced, I think in the 1940s, uh, to address the issue of uh, frustration and contracts. There have been decades uh, passed since then where various attempts have been made to rely on a uh, on a frustration in order to get out of a contract. And on each and every occasion, well, on pretty much every occasion, that's probably fairer, um, the party seeking to rely on the contract being frustrated has itself been frustrated by the court saying no. So, um, have there been any recent developments? Well, yes, there have, uh, because a few weeks ago it was reported that an individual had taken issue with British Airways and the attempt by British Airways to offer the individual, I think, a voucher in lieu of the individual not being able to fly because British Airways had decided not to operate a particular service as a result of COVID. So uh, the individual says, no, I'd like my money back. And um, the attempt by British Airways to argue that the contract had been frustrated, that did not get anywhere at all. And the yeah. individual and the individual was successful. Hmm. Now, Will that case be followed? Good question. Uh, that case was, I believe, a county court case. It is, as lawyers would say, of persuasive authority. Um, would the facts of the next case have to mirror those in that case in order for a party seeking to be able to rely on frustration to be able to do so? Yes, I think that's uh, I think that's a pretty much a racing certainty, but um, it certainly made news so far as legal circles were concerned that this had been the case, and that uh, the courts had been prepared to go along um, with uh, an argument that uh, meant that frustration was successful, and the individual in question was able to get their money back from British Airways instead of the voucher the British Airways wanted to give. Mm, interesting. So, um, <clears throat> so if a contract is, isn't performed, if, if for some reason the contract doesn't happen or, or isn't delivered, what, what um, um, obviously this can have impacts both on the seller and, and, and the buyer. So, um, what would be the impact on the agent, for instance? So, uh, well, first of all, let, let's just back up. Um, well, in fact, yeah. What, what would the impact be on the buyers and the sellers? <laughs> we'll go on, on, to on it. the seller and the buyer. Starting point has to be: What does the contract provide in the event that there is non-performance? Is the seller, for example, able to claim for damages? If so, what are the extent of the damages which it is able to claim? If the um, buyer doesn't perform, can the seller claim 
or damages in terms of the profit that it would have lost as a result of the contract not being performed. Answer? Answer is generally to be found in the terms conditions of sale or the terms conditions of purchase, which should have been incorporated into the contract between seller and buyer. And I say should for all the reasons that we've touched on uh, earlier on uh, in this podcast. Moving on from that, if the contract is not performed, what is the impact on the agent? Well, in some situations, if the reason for non-performance is a reason for which the seller, usually, because usually agents act for sellers, although occasionally they do act for buyers where they're mm -hmm. purchasing agents, but usually where the agent is acting for the seller and the contract is not performed, then if the reason why the contract has not been performed is a reason which is attributable to the seller, then the seller can find itself in the subject of a claim by the agent for commission on the contract which has not been fulfilled by the seller. So even though the seller doesn't perform the contract and doesn't collect on the proceeds of sale and one would hope its profit, it may find itself even more out of pocket by being subject to a claim for commission from the agent mm. on the unfulfilled contract. Depending on the non-performance in question, or possibly a situation where there are a series of contracts by the seller, which the agent has played a role in obtaining for the seller, and those contracts are not performed by the seller, we might get to a position where the agent says the seller's performance of my agency agreement is such that the seller has broken my agency agreement, and I'm going to accept that as bringing the agreement to an end, and here is my claim for compensation or what is called in as uh, so far as the law is concerned, at which point what did start out as a bad day for the seller has just got considerably worse. Certainly has. It's um, yes. I mean that's good for good for agents, but it's, uh, <laughs> good for agents and not not good for um, their principles. I agree. No, no, and again, a really good um, um, reason behind why a good contract between your agent and your um, yeah, and, and the principle um, it, it, it can, certainly can to uh, limit liability so far as the principle is concerned. Um, and but, uh, claim for damages as well. So. Well, I was, I was going to say, even if the agent does not claim for a uh, commission on a contract which has not been performed by the seller, and even if the agent can't claim that the seller's performance has been such as to bring the agency agreement to an end and therefore uh, put the agent in a position where he can claim either compensation or indemnity, the agent may still be able to claim for damages because the law says that there is an obligation on the principal, in this case the seller, to to track the language of the uh, of the legislation, to act dutifully and in good faith. And one can certainly, I think, present a decent argument to say that if the seller goes about not performing contracts which have been entered into by the seller as a result of the agent's efforts, that the seller is not acting dutifully so far as the agent is concerned, at which point there's a claim for damages. Although, whether it's uh, good or bad depends upon uh, your view, in that situation, the agency agreement itself still continues. It's just a claim that the agent has uh, for damages if the agent wants to pursue that claim. And is it a similar situation when it comes to distributors as well in terms of claiming for compensation or damages? Certainly for damages, uh, yes. Um, 
here we have a situation where the seller will actually be selling to the distributor and yeah. then the distributor will be reselling to its customer right so the first thing is and go back to basics what are the terms conditions so far as the contract for the sale of goods between seller and distributor um and we've discussed that again during the course of this uh, podcast but then we get to a situation of okay if there is non-performance and arguably non-performance to such a degree as to show that the um, seller is not performing the overall distributorship contract between the seller and the distributor can the distributor claim for compensation it's an interesting one why because certainly over the course of about the last 14 years the courts in this country have shown themselves increasingly willing to recognize that there can be a claim for um, compensation which is in many ways comparable to the claim that an agent will have for compensation on the loss of the agency agreement and so we can be in a situation where the distributor can say the we have a distributorship agreement it is in writing um it does provide for uh termination in the event of non-performance uh, thus called breach um my view is as the distributor that you the seller have breached the agreement the agreement's at an end here is my claim for damages and i'm going to ask the court in effect and i emphasize the in effect to calculate damages in that situation as if i was an agent and i was claiming for compensation so that of itself can move the dial considerably in terms of what the distributor can achieve in the event that there is non-performance by the seller. Hmm. And is the situation similar or different if the non-performance is um, on the part of, by the purchaser rather than the seller? Does that affect it differently? So here would be where the distributor is then selling on to uh, the purchaser. Um, and then again, it comes back to what are the terms upon which the distributor is selling to the purchaser? Are they the distributor's terms, conditions of sale, brackets, in effect, resale, close brackets, or are they the terms, conditions of purchase of the, uh, of the purchaser from the distributor? And then depending upon which apply, if either, then uh, damages will be determined accordingly. And, and as, as far as an agent is concerned in that scenario, would that um, would there be anything an agent could do? Uh, in terms of the agent being the agent of which party? If it was, well, the agent of the seller, but the fault of the um, the contract not being performed is down to the Well, buyer. we do get we do get situations where distributors do have agents uh, distributors do let down their agents in terms of non-performance and in that situation if the reason for non-performance is with the distributor then the agent is going to have a claim yes yeah i understand so yeah so um is there anything else that um, you'd like to sort of mention any, any about the um, these contracts and sales and terms and conditions of sale and purchase that we haven't touched on on this uh, obviously um, very brief overview <laughs> of a complex uh, complex scenario? I think there is one particular situation, and that applies in respect to any uh, federation members who are selling outside of the UK. So if they're a federation member selling 
have example in Ireland, uh, selling into parts of the European Union, and um, they haven't got their terms, conditions of sale properly prepared or properly incorporated, even if they have been properly prepared. Um, if they haven't got them uh, done, then they are taking a considerable risk. Why? Because they may find themselves in a situation where, firstly, uh, it is not, uh, for example, English law, which governs the contract of sale between them and their customer. It might be Irish law. It might be French law, mm. and so on and so forth. Second, depending upon the relationship which has existed between the parties at, uh, at the time that the relationship turns sour, it would not be too difficult in certain situations for the buyer to say, I have been acting as your distributor. And according to my law, as a result of the relationship between us, aka the distributorship agreement coming to an end, I'm going to claim compensation from you. So we move from a situation where the M and a federation member having sold into, for example, France for a fair period of time uh, to a particular party and having thought that it's just dealing on a sale and purchase basis as and when orders are made, then finds itself facing a claim from the French party that the French party is a distributor and consequences can flow as a result from that. Mm. So the message really is for everybody, it, it's, it's, it's always a good idea to review your terms of conditions of sale and purchase or whichever one is most appropriate. And I'm sure most businesses do it both ways anyway. And, um, and to make sure you regularly review them and also to take proper professional advice, because it seems to me there are lots of potential pitfalls and, uh, Things, you know, the events of the past few years, Brexit and COVID and, and others, no doubt, that um, have, have not been anticipated are another good reason to make sure that um, they are sort of fit for purpose going forward in this brave new world. And, and in particular, too, if you're dealing with any business overseas um, into, into, yeah, into Europe or vice versa. Fit for purpose and properly incorporated into the contract which you think you're making yeah um, that, that's really obviously key it's not just as, as we said earlier it's not just a question of having some terms and conditions on the back of the invoice that's too late and probably not sufficiently protective of your interests very much agree. Um, Stephen, thank you very much indeed. That was really interesting, and I hope will serve uh, for those of you who, who listen to us as a as a reminder of the importance of uh, getting your terms and conditions correct. And of course, Stephen and his team at Fox Williams are will are always there and available at the end of the line for our members to talk to if you wish. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you.